I know hormone replacement is a huge part of what you do. And uh, so maybe you can give the audience an yeah. idea of why hormone replacement is important. I found a, a 40% decrease in all mortality hmm. women with these hormones. They found, you know, there's a ton of cardiac benefits. There's thousands of hormones receptors in the heart, cardiac, less hip fractures, memory, critical thinking. Most of these women in this, in this country die from heart disease. It's, it's mm -hmm. over 50% leading cause of mortality. You have a 400% more risk of added to that if you're sedentary and have high blood sugar. So important things to look at, the benefits of it. But there's a lot of demonization on hormones. And then, you know, estrogen does not increase the risk of cancer. That's just not what the data shows. Hello, welcome back, everybody. This is Dr. Joy Kong Podcast. I am so excited today because we're covering a very important subject, hormone replacement, and of course, everything anti-aging. But as you know, I bring some of the top experts in the field of anti-aging, regenerative medicine, uh, or just, um, you know, wellness and um, even the science of happiness. So I, my goal is to elevate the happiness factor in the world and, um, uh, it brings together physical, psychological, and spiritual health. So we cover it all. And today, I have the great pleasure of having Michael Brookins with me. Michael, so hey. happy to be here. Thanks for having me, Joy. Yeah, so Mike is amazing. Um, you know, we, we've actually been friends. I've learned a lot from him. So I'm really excited for him to share his expertise. Uh, he's owner of the Age Management Institute, where they focus on longevity, hormone replacement, and regenerative medicine. So um, just a, you know, a little bit of summary of his background. His medical background is in nuclear medicine, specializing in interventional endocrinology. And he brings more than just medical perspective to his field. Uh, at a young age, he began his career as a competitive athlete that would end up taking him on an incredible journey over the next 13 years of his life. Throughout his athletic journey, he constantly worked to find the ideal balance of fitness, proper nutrition, and hormone optimization in order to maximize his performance. And he utilizes his background combined with his medical knowledge he brings together a unique, comprehensive, and successful combination that serves to benefit his staff and those around him. Well, you benefit a lot of patients. So I know you have uh, this amazing clinic in Santa Barbara, and you treat a lot of celebrity patients. Um, so you must have done something right. Otherwise, you know, all these people wouldn't keep coming back. So, um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm excited. I've learned a lot from you. And, I learned a lot from you. <laughs> oh, thank you. Yeah, maybe you can start by telling us a little bit, a bit about your story, your athletic yeah. career, and how that, you know, ended up, uh, ended you on this journey of... Um, sure, sure. Um, I mean, I was, a, I was a competitive pole vaulter all through college and went to Olympic trials. And, you know, it was always, I always find that athletes are really in tune with their body. Like we have a, a higher inkling of, we know when we're sick, we know we're not well, we have a little bit better just foundational functional awareness of of how we are when we're well how we are when we're not well so with that background and then going into nuclear medicine um you know i was doing a lot of thyroid ablations with radioactive iodine on patients who had hyperthyroidism or thyroid cancer and eight years of doing that you kind of look at yourself in the mirror and say there's a, there's a much better way to treat people with functional medicine and integrative medicine. And as an athlete, you just kind of know nutrition, stress management, movement, um, sleep, like there's just better tools out there. So I quit my job <laughs> mm. and I found A4M, which is the American Academy of Anti-Aging Regenerative Medicine, which Joy and I are both proud to be board certified in that. And I jumped the pond and got into more functional integrative medicine. Now, I'm not a doctor. I don't really treat, practice, or, or you know, diagnose and, and prescribe. But I, I found my calling with building anti-aging regenerative medicine clinics, functional medicine clinics. I hire more talented, smarter people than me. And I train and teach physicians on proper bioidentical hormone replacement therapy. And uh, our big clinic in Santa Barbara is Eternity Health Partners, and I own the management service organization, which is just as the management, the, the training, and everything. So 
I'm kind of like the Wizard of Oz. I'm the I'm behind the scenes, you know, pulling levers and <laughs> and making sure everything is uh, is proper and and people get great optimization. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, it's fantastic from radiology to functional medicine. And, yeah, uh, and fun, uh, I know. And so I know hormone replacement is a huge part of what you do. And um, a lot of doctors, well, even functional medicine doctors, I mean, some are familiar, but of course, most doctors have no idea about uh, hormone replacement. And I, it's surprising to me, I think even naturopathic schools, they don't talk a whole lot about hormone replacement. So this is a very niche area, but yeah. people have so many questions and, and are super yeah. curious. So I think there, there's a huge wave of awareness, right? There's- There, uh, there is, you know, when, when, you know, you and I started at A4M, there was, which is, you know, the, the basically the, the college that teaches, functional integrative biodynamic hormone is definitely their standard gold standard um you know cornerstone there were 300 people in those auditoriums now there's like 6000 8000 mm. i i love it that uh, there's a lot of traditional doctors that feel the same way and they don't feel like they're really helping patients 100% just throwing Xanax and Prozac at women when it's really a hormone issue and they're they're also kind of looking to expand their career and, and do things the, the right way. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So maybe you can um, give the audience an yeah. idea of why hormone replacement is important. I'm happy to. So I can start with just women's bioidentical hormones. This is a clinic that my providers, this is a, this is a question that my providers see all the time. And it's, you know, women, there's a lot of demonization on hormones. And this this mm -hmm. all started with a a study in 2002 and you know that said estrogen increases the risk of cancer um and then you know that was gosh that was 22 years ago and then a study came out 10 years after saying you know with all of the new bioidenticals and things that people were doing that it does not women's bioidentical ho hormones there's a there's a lot of just you know fear porn out there that it, it causes um you know cancer and there's some just some old data that seem to stuck stick with the rhetoric with traditional doctors and you know the the data just doesn't say that you know estrogen does not increase the risk of cancer that's just not what the data shows it's it's fear porn like i said it's old data from flawed studies that are looking at you know looking at women who are doing synthetic estrogen and progesterone mm -hmm. which is not what we do we do bioidentical so you know there's so right. much more data there's the moment so you start messing with nature, because they can't patent the identical hormones. Bingo, right? bingo. So, uh, and, you, and then you, you want to make money. Yeah, you get into the pharmaceutical and the regulatory agencies, which I won't mention, but they're <laughs> very political and very money driven. So, you know, it, there's so much data now with bioidentical, not synthetic hormones, reducing their, all these comorbidity risk and even improving osteoporosis, bone density, mood, risk of dementia, metabolic disease. I mean, the list just goes on and on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so the, the fear, uh, in 2002, that the study was mostly talking about estrogen or were they concerned? Yeah. So about what happened well? is, you know, what really, I'll, I'll kind of lay it out here in the, in the nineties, we had so many women on synthetic hormones that you, you would, that, that they would get and I mean, st still today, OBGYN and family practice doctors are giving birth control. You know, they're still giving these synthetics. Um, and they get recommended for some absurd reason that I, I just don't understand. But I mean, he here's the truth. I'm going to, di I'll dissect this pretty good. Um, so that was in the 90s. In 2002, a British study came out and it was called the Women's Healthcare Initiative. And it said estrogen increases breast cancer. I mean, it was 22 years ago. It was a study based on synthetic hormones only. It looked at Primarin and Progestin, which was the estrogen and the progesterone. Synthetic, made out of horse urine. Yeah, mm -hmm. don't don't take that, obviously. Um, <laughs> but it, <laughs> anyway, it's it's been so ingrained and indoctrinated in the minds of traditional healthcare and our pharmaceutical industry trying to push their big pharmaceutical medications. Um, but again, yeah, these medications were synthetic. Um, it's, it was chemically man-made and, you know, it, it turns out the, in the results of the study, it showed a 26% increase mm. in, in risk of breast cancer. Well, anybody who heard that saw 
26% of these patients got cancer. That just wasn't true. Mm -hmm. Only one out of 10,000 did. So mm -hmm. overnight, hormone prescriptions went from 15 million to 2 million across the country. Wow. Yeah, it got demonized. Um, again, all these hormones they used back there were synthetics, not orals, which, I mean, they, they were synthetics and orals. So when you take a synthetic hormone, it goes through the first pass, it goes through the liver, your body has to cleave off carbon chains to make it bioidentical. These carbon chains go out into the body, create free radicals, oxidative mm. stress. Your body doesn't like it. So these had certain side effects. Um, you know, but there, there were actually some good things found in the article. Um, you know, they, they found like a 40% a decrease in all mortality mm. women with these hormones. They found... Um, you know, there's a ton of cardiac benefits. There's thousands of hormones receptors in the heart. Um, they, they found, you know, 20% had, you know, decreases all course and mortality of death. Um, and, you know, there was just, there was a ton of benefits really outweighing the risks. Cardiac, less hip fractures, memory, critical thinking. Um, you know, most of these women in this, in this country die from heart disease. It's, it's mm -hmm. over 50% leading cause of mortality. You have a 400% more risk of, added to that if you're sedentary you have high blood sugar so there's more important things to look at the benefits of it but um so that was the study that came out in 2002 there was a study that came out in 20 i think it was i think it was 2019 north american study um from the menopause association i believe mm -hmm. um it, it actually retracted this 2002 women's Healthcare initiative study and yeah. And there's so many studies being published today, which again, benefits greatly outweighing the risk, largely due to women having accessibility to bioidentical hormones. But isn't it amazing that most doctors are still stuck in 20, 2002 study, right? It's just like that fear mongering. And then they refuse to let go of that fear, even though it's been proven otherwise, but they're not keeping up with it. Yeah, and, and you get it. Where do doctors learn medicine? from pharmaceutical industries and mm -hmm. pharmaceutical industries are pushing birth control, which birth control is just synthetic progesterone. They're like, Oh, you don't want to do hormones. Let me give you some birth control to kind of make things homeostatic status. And I'm like, that's just a massive dose of synthetic hormone. Like you're, you're doing a further. And I just don't get it. You know, it drives, it drives all of my providers kind of, kind of crazy. Once you, once you see the results with patients, once you see their, DEXA scan improving, when you, you see their critical thinking, verbal memory go up, you see their A1C blood sugar go down, their body composition changes, their life just gets better. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so that's estrogen. And, yeah. uh, that's and there's also some concern. And progesterone. Yeah. So, okay. Yeah. So progesterone was thrown in there as well. People are afraid of progesterone as well. Yep. 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 Okay. Well, and well, testosterone. There's also fear about testosterone. Yeah. Yeah. So today we have the BHRT topicals and, and, and bioidentical hormones are largely made in custom compounding pharmacies. You can get them. There, there, are, there are now, of course, some, some uh, things you can get at CVS and Walgreens that are bioidenticals. But the di difference between bioidenticals and synthetics is they're, they don't go through the liver and they're identical to your own, own hormones. So, you know, they are made from yams and sweet potatoes or soy they are, they are recumbent into hormones that are bioidentical to your own hormones. Your body can't tell the difference. And yeah, it's just, they're, they're, they're safe. So. Yeah. So the big pharma, I mean, Endrogel is actually bioidentical, right? So they. Yeah. They all produce... testosterone, all testosterone yeah. is bioidentical. So, so <laughs> the testosterone, Cipine, so there are a few different forms. They're mm -hmm. all considered identical to the body. Yeah, they're all identical to the body. If, if you know, you have to find things that are that say bioidentical, but um, uh, they're they're bioidentical to the body. And and the three big hormones for women are going to be progesterone, testosterone, and um, estrogen. So that's, mm -hmm. that's what they're going to do. And then and men, for men they're, they're, is testosterone. Yeah, much. testosterone, and then there's other analogs you can take to keep fertility going, keep testicle atrophy down, mm -hmm. including HCG things like that will will work really well. Yeah. So are there any risks of doing hormone replacement? Um, so there, the, the risk, there's risk with any medication. Um, you know, I, I like an old, I think it was Socrates or Plato that said, 
the only difference between a poison and a medication is the dose. Mm. <laughs> so, you know, there's risk with it with anything, but they're, they're mitigated with a trained functional integrative doctor that uses blood work, knows certain levels that get out, you know, a little wonky, but it comes with dose. You know, we always say start low, go slow mm -hmm. with hormones and, you know, start in the lowest dose. And then in eight weeks, pull another set of blood work. And then you can titrate the labs up, up there, but we, we got it down to a pretty good art form now. And, you know, women just don't have you know, terrible side effects. There's little things like if you give too much estrogen, breast tenderness, if you're not giving too much enough estrogen, night flashes don't vanish, but you largely go by the symptoms of the patient versus the blood work. I, when we train doctors, we say, don't treat the labs, treat the patient. Mm -hmm. and use the labs as a guide only, you know, so. Yeah. Um, so I, I know there's, yeah, it's pretty complex. The hormones can get pretty complex. Um, yeah, yeah. There are different metabolites and, and you yeah. know, there are feedback loops and et cetera. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So like, for instance, when we, for, when we see a woman in the office, we, 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 let's say, uh, you know, women generally are low in progesterone about eight to 10 years before the big change of 51. So late 30s, early 40s, mm. when you first go into perimenopause, you first want to use progesterone on women. Mm. What are, are the symptoms when? Um, yeah, the symptoms body. would be like, they're very critical. They're very anxious. The, mm -hmm. All the Karens you see out there, <laughs> they need progesterone. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I always like to use that and because people understand that. So um, that can be a good one to use first, you know generally early, early, early forties, late thirties, women need a little micronized bioidentical progesterone pill. You take it for bed. It makes you calm, good sleeps, gets rid of the any night sweats. Mm -hmm. You're not going to bite your husband's head off. You're not yelling at your kids, you know, things like that. Well, first of all, yeah. why do you think the hormone levels decline? And do you think for some, maybe some individuals, they don't? That's, that's a really good question. Um, and I think what we're kind of seeing in the U.S. is microplastics in the environment, petrochemicals. If you look back at the data, I'm a data nerd, and you look back into the 30s and 40s and 50s, women and men had awesome hormone levels. And you look at mm. pictures of them on the beach. Everybody's lean. Everybody smoked, drank whiskey, <laughs> ate steaks. I mean, think about it. You look at photo, like old photos of like Santa Monica Pier. And in the 40s and 50s, people were lean and they looked, you know, robust. Mm. Um, and then we had an introduction of glyphosates and petrochemicals and microplastics and things. So I think there's a lot of endocrine disruptors in our environment. Um, and then also just sedentary lifestyle, foods rich with sugar and high fructose corn syrup. Obes obesity will just crush your hormones. You know, mm. you, take a you take a teenager, they get them overweight. They're going to have half the hormones of their mm -hmm. peers at normal body. Okay. Because so I know once in a while we will in encounter somebody in their 60s, 70s who has fantastic testosterone level, right? Once in a while. Yeah, we, we see it too. I mean, my, my Italians, my people from, from France, mm -hmm. uh, overseas, I'll, I'll see old Italian guys that I'm like, how's the libido? And they're like, awesome, 85 <laughs> year old, you know, still, still out oh, there. Oh, my goodness. Still out there getting it, oh, testosterone to nine hundred. So, I'll wow. see it with my with my blue zoners. You know, my people from Sard Sardinia and Okinawa and, and places like that outside the U.S. But I do get a handful of Americans. You know that mm. maintain a healthy lifestyle. They, do you they see the same diet. thing in female hormones with the uh, females from those regions? I do, I do. Um, and then of course you can't beat Mother Nature and menopause thing too. But we, we will notice women that just kind of have cruise right through menopause, didn't notice a big change. Uh, they might come see us at 60, 65 and mm. say, you know, I, I was wondering if hormones could still help me. I know I'm past the menopause, but I, I heard I'm not supposed to start hormones later. Mm. You can absolutely start hormones later with, without potential risk. When you do it the right way, use bioidentical mm. under a trained, trained physician mm -hmm. and, reap, and reap the benefits, you know? So are there studies done on older women getting on hormone replacement and seeing how that impacted their health? There, there are. I can recommend some links to you if you want to kind of post at the end where they can read. Deborah Matthews, who's incredible. She's written some really good books summarizing 
you know, mm-hmm. this this really dense uh, studies uh, and, and made it kind of in layman's terms. And how would it help them if they get uh, look, look at women in their 70s and 80s, hip fractures, osteoporosis. Oh. You get a hip fracture at 80, that's it. So mm-hmm. women using a little bit of bioidentical testosterone cream, um, you know, really helps with bone density. Women need to keep their estrogen above 60. Uh, it's just amazing for osteoporosis. So we'll look at blood work and say, I think it's 60 picograms per milliliter. Uh, but, you know, my providers will look and make sure estrogen's above that, but very oste- uh, very osteo um, um, strong with, with that. So, mm-hmm. yeah. yeah. So what are some of the myths that are persisting? I think you covered one yeah, of them, that's, that's, which that's is estrogen big, causing cancer. That's the big and, myth. I think and also that, testosterone people are afraid of uh, prostate cancer. Afraid of po- prostate cancer. And Abraham Morgan Thaler, thank God for him. He's done an incredible job. He's the head professor of urology at Harvard. Very Western traditional guy, you know, going to bat for the boys in functional medicine and girls. Um, but he is ri- he's the only one that's done the 20 year hmm. the study. And he said, look, he, he wrote a great book for you guys there at home, men and women. It's called Testosterone for Life. But he's done a wonderful job of proving that testosterone doesn't cause prostate cancer. It doesn't cause, you know, um, just mortality. It's not cardiotoxic, things like that. And what he found was, yeah, when, when testosterone, when it goes into the body, it converts to DHT and estrogen. So, mm-hmm. you know, actually the, the number of men who were doing testosterone uh, with doctors who are watching estrogen, watching hematocrit, watching DHT, which can make PSA go up. The amount of men, well, the rate of prostate cancer with men is one in seven men are going to get it. The amount of men who are getting prostate cancer now who are on testosterone under the watchful eye of a doctor, it's less than 1%. Mm, Explain that to me. So because estrogen's controlled, it's watched, DHT's watched. We run PSA on patients. If it goes up a little bit, send them to the urologist for digital rectal exam. Like you just, it's preventative medicine. You stay on top of it. Mm, wow. Yeah. So, and of course there are many, you know, I, yeah. So I, I tell people, cause I mean, people are scared. Uh, people who mm. had prostate cancer and their doctors are telling them, no, you absolutely don't need, I had a person who was doing fantastic and, and then, you know, he got a little bit, um, some, some kind of, uh, you know, you know, low grade prostate cancer, but so he got went through some therapy and the doctor was insisting that he had to get off hormone replacement. Oh, and right. he was so miserable. He yeah. was just knocked flat, you know, on, on his face and, you know, uh, and, and he was, he was scared to get yeah. back on it, even though it made him feel amazing, you know, gave him a quality of life. He was yeah. so scared because the doctor said no. Yeah. And, and there's like just this old, old rhetoric of it. And I, I found doctors, will say no to things they don't know. <laughs> Instead of our, our providers, I learned, we learn so much from patients that we do our own independent study. But if we don't know something, we go, I don't know, but I'm gonna go find out. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think that there's, there's a lot of traditional doctors, I, wanna, I don't wanna put anybody in a box, but if they don't know something, the answer is no, right off the get go. Doctors are not trained in this. Family practice, internists, they're not trained in bioidentical hormone replacement theory, OBGYNs, and endocrinologists alike are not trained in this. Yeah. Endos do thyroid, adrenal insufficiencies, and diabetes. Exactly. OBGYNs, a little bit of birth control and pelvic exam, things like that. But I've trained OBGYNs and they're like, oh, I can give testosterone. Uh, yeah. And you should. Yeah. You're so right. You know, mo- so many traditional doctors, they will say no if they don't know. So, um, yeah. for example, stem cells. I, you know, a, a lot of people are scared to tell their primary care doctor because they probably will say no. And some have said no, or some specialists have said, well, there's no evidence it works. And my question is always, have you ever looked for the evidence? Because I can send you evidence if yeah, you're interested. <laughs> and no one is interested. <laughs> so. they're not, they're, yeah, I know. It, it, it's, they, they got a good thing going right now and it's, it, it, they're going to stick with it, but that's fine. Right. It's just an exactly. opportunity for patients to find us and mm-hmm. for us to, give good back in the world and help people. It's, yeah. that's, why we, that's why we were put here. So, And any other myths about uh, hormone replacement? That um, yeah, same away? thing with like, um, I think, uh, yeah, breast cancer, 
prostate cancer. Oh, it's going to be bad for my heart. I heard people about having heart attacks. Again, it's about mm. dosage. And, you know, when, when men do testosterone, hematocrit hemoglobin can go up. And that's not a bad thing. It sends oxygen throughout the body, things like that. But if hematocrit hemoglobin go too high up, sure, it can make the blood more viscous. You run the risk of blood clot, DVT, heart attack. But again, we watch this. You know, I, I like it to bump up, or our providers like it to bump up a little bit. Patients have more energy. They're, they're, they're crushing their workouts. Um, if it goes, if hematocrit goes to 55% or um, hemoglobin go to 19%, Patient gives blood, give a pint of blood once a year, um, go to the Red Cross, give back to the little people and give blood and it drops 8%. So that's- Well, that's there's the actually health benefits for, well, bloodletting, really that's bloodletting. And some people sure. think that even for women, every month having a menstrual cycle, that's actually a really good way of triggering this regenerative response in the body. Absolutely, absolutely. So it's, it's not everybody we have to do a, a bloodletting <laughs> or a lobotomy is what we what we call it, but it, again, it's if you manage them rightly, you you give the right amount, you give the you know the lowest dose possible to achieve the greatest result, and you lose low dosages more frequently throughout the throughout the week. That's a great little secret with uh, BHRT. I don't see estrogen go up. I don't see DHT go up. I don't see hematocrit hemoglobin go up. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and patients feel awesome, and all yeah. the all the preventative you know imaging and stuff you see things get better and better. Hmm. And the, there's another concern that some people voice. They say, well, you know, if, if I take a, a replacement of hormones, then I'm stuck with it for the rest of my life. It's going to shut down my own hormone production. Then I, I, I would never be able to get off it. So what's your response to that? That's, that's not true at all. I have, I've had so many men come off testosterone and, and they were like, oh, I want to have a child. I want to I have kids. I heard I can't have kids again. No, the, the, the body has these negative feedback loops. And yeah, when you start testosterone, your LHFSH in your brain goes down, the signal to your serotoli cells of the testicles to make more spermogenesis. That dips a little bit. We always give, or our providers give, a enclomiphene or HCG for free, mm -hmm. along with the testosterone. It keeps your body like mother nature, keeps all these negative feedback loops going. You're still producing spermogenesis, things like that. Um, they're still able to conceive while on testosterone. Um, and if they ever want to stop testosterone, great. They stop, run a little enclomiphene or HCG afterwards. The body reboots. If all your plumbing works before you started TRT or testosterone and mm. you could conceive, you can conceive after. I, we've never had an issue. I've had... Every single one of my, I can't think of one that has, I'm not going to say hundred percent, but majority of the patients who come through us, who they're able to conceive just fine on testosterone treatment, uh, your body reboots afterwards. Um, and I have a lot of men too, who, who've been on TRT, testosterone replacement therapy, and just don't want to run it anymore. And they're like, do I have to do this for life? I'm like, no, stop doing it. Let's just run in clomiphene, which is a natural testosterone booster it raises the signal mm -hmm. in the brain to make more testosterone and things and mm -hmm. um i got a seven-year-old guy with a testosterone of a thousand it's his mm -hmm. testosterone mm -hmm. <laughs> he just he takes a little capsule uh, bioidentical enclomiphene twice a week mm -hmm. uh, works works very well interesting okay and then i want to you know ask you about uh, different forms of hormone replacement because yeah. that's a big question that confuses a lot of people and a lot of doctors I and mean, there's diverging opinions about what's the best form uh there are mm -hmm. creams or injectables gels pellets mm -hmm. and of course there's oral form so what yep. what's <laughs> how so do you, you navigate this there's there's the first thing is sustainability with patients you, you want to ask them can you give yourself an injection twice a week? If they're like, uh, I don't know. I know they're not going to be a patient of ours for very long. So it's like, okay, would you be more comfortable with like a cream you put on every morning, like your deodorant? Yeah, that, that sounds like a, a little bit more doable for me. Um, so we, there's, there's creams for hormones, all three hormones. There's injectable testosterone. There's oral, you know, progesterone. There's pellets. Those are probably the four roots of administration that I, I see. Um, with our, our providers personally really like creams. Um, and it kind of makes sense when you're staging too. If 
bioidentical, a bias crane, which is 80% estro oil, 20% estradiol, not what your OBGYN is going to give you, which is pure estrogen or estradiol. Estro oil greatly softens some of the harsh feelings estro estradiol can give you. So it's 80% estro oil, 20% estradiol. You start with a low 5, 10 milligram, one click on a little deodorant stick, apply it directly to the clitoris or the you know intralabial. That's where the receptor is. So the body is going to pick it up better. It's going to be a little bit more bioavailable. You could do inner thighs and forearms too, but intravaginally, uh, it seems to, uh, from what our providers have noticed, it works a lot better. Um, and then a, just a, an oral progesterone pill at night. Same thing with the testosterone cream for women, just directly to the hoo-ha. And uh, <laughs> you know, it's like 10, 10 milligrams and then one click. So not, can, not inside the, the vaginal canal, but it's right on the vulva. Uh, Okay. Yeah, you just kind of, you just, yeah, right, right to the clitoris, actually, okay. clitoris blood and intralabial. Um, okay. uh, it, it blood works uh, sh shown improvement, uh, I think, a little bit more readily. Um, and then for men, they have the choice of monotherapy with enclomiphene, a little pill, um, or testosterone cream applied to the scrotum, or um, testosterone injections, you know. like The so scrotum is the best place for the testosterone. Closest to the receptor, yeah. What about uh, for women? Um, yeah, women. Obviously not to the scrotum, but to the to the, <laughs> the forest, to the is is the best. There's there's a phenomenon that our providers have seen over the years called transdermal fatigue. Mm. And when men, especially when they use androgel, I see, see it more with that product than anything else. Not so much the bioidentical mm. grains from custom compounding pharmacies, but if they're applying to the arms for six months, a year, it stops working. We stop mm. seeing the labs improving. And oh. it, it kind of makes sense. I think the, the anomaly is your epidermis is your best defense. It's, and it, it's, it's a part of your immune system, right? And it, it kind of figures out, okay, this is, this is foreign. I'm going to, I'm going to block this out. So sometimes the creams just stop working. Mm. Uh, and then the men need to either switch to enclomiphene capsule to just naturally raise their own testosterone or do injectable. Well, if they rotate the spots, would that solve the they, problem? They, yes, they can rotate spots, thighs, scrotum, forearms. Um, I see it a lot less with scrotum testosterone cream. Hmm. Uh, yeah. Okay, because I was told you were supposed to rotate on different sides on different days. Is that? Yeah. <laughs> How long I mean, does if, that work? Yeah, if, if women are just going, you know, uh, clitoris, intralabial, and men are just going to scrotum, them, I, I rarely see an issue. Do that every morning. Uh, I also like creams because if you look at the diurnal production of hormones, mm -hmm. we make a lot during REM sleep, it's produced, it's released, it goes up during the day and then it comes right back down at, at night. So this, it, it, it just kind of does this throughout the day. And it's so when's the best time to you to put a hormone? Uh, morning for estrogen and testosterone, progesterone at night. Okay. Yeah, that's that's and that's just this is just what we do for majority women. There's there's going to be some advanced techniques and protocols that you you do for other women just based on lifestyle and what you see. But generally, that's what my docs like to do. Um, but with that dirt diurnal rhythm, using creams every day, which do the same thing, it's closer to Mother Nature. It's closer to those diurnal circadian rhythms of our hormones, and I, I think the body just likes that. You don't feel like you're on a roller coaster. Yeah. Um, it's just, it's just more naturopathic. What do you think of some doctors? Well, I, I think it's rare. Um, some rare doctors who actually imitate the the cycle of changes of the hormones uh, along with yeah. your menstrual cycle. So you, you yeah. take different amounts every day. Is that, um, is that you think is necessary? We, we, have, we have some women that want to do that to maintain their menstrual cycle and things like that. But when we talk to a woman in their 40s and stuff and say hey you're gonna you're gonna take progesterone every single day your your menstruation is not going to be as bad if you have painful menstruation or it's not going to be as heavy of a bleed is that okay they're like yeah i'm gonna take it every day some women like to take it cycle it throughout their pregnancy or pregnancy they like to cycle mm -hmm. it during the month for um ovulation and um just uh their, their same menstruation but oh so you that that's not something you regularly do uh, I our, thought our, progesterone, our, I remember I was, you know, supposed to be yeah. dead, what, 15 to 25 
you know, that's when you do progesterone. Yeah, our, our docs, for the majority, they they just give it every day. You know, oh. the women in their 30s, 50 milligrams. Women in their 40s, perimenopausal, 100 milligrams. Women in menopause, 200 milligrams. That's a great starting protocol for, oh. for a lot of women with progesterone. And um, I'm just, I'm speaking on behalf of all of this for my providers, and they just give it every day. Yeah. Interesting. They start slicing and dicing the protocol too much, and you just don't have to make it that complicated. Think about the sustainability for the patient too. You know, I our doctors are trained not to be kitchen sink providers. We don't throw a whole lot at our patients at the very get go. We make it very easy: a couple supplements, maybe a couple peptides, a few stem cell treatments a year. Make it very simple to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. There are a few questions. So. Um, you know, first of all, if you're doing it every day, um, are you still going to, you know, people in their thirties, forties, fifties, um, if you're doing progesterone daily, are you going to have the menstrual cycle normally? You, you will. Yeah. So, some women will not as, not as much or they'll stop, but for, for the most part, women still menstruate, they can still get, they can still have pregnancy, things like that. Um, it, it might be not as a shorter period, not as heavy as a bleed, um, but yeah, so it, it might not, maybe not as regular as they are. What we've noticed though with women in their forties is iron and ferritin being mm. low and then feeling very tired after their period. I'd be like, hey, you got heavy periods still, your ferritin's really low. How about we shorten this a little bit, keep the, the bleed not as bad and your ferritin and iron are gonna go up, energy's gonna go up, your insomnia is gonna go away. With, just with progesterone, improving the ferritin. So just mm -hmm. little, little caveats sort of like that. Yeah. Okay. So even, so same level of estrogen throughout the, the menstrual cycle and same level of progesterone. You're, you're, and people are doing pretty well and having a normal menstrual cycle. Yeah. 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 Hmm. yeah because well, at a four a.m., at least some uh, some doctors was teaching withdrawing all hormones uh, by about like five days before menstruation, like before you're yeah. supposed to menstruate. And what do you think of that? There's a lot of different. They call it a practice for a reason. I think d doctors practice on patients to figure out their own little art, and you know, it's it just kind of depends on how you've been indoctrinated and what you like to do. I know some of our providers will do that you know, based on what they hear from the patient. But um, you can just, for the most part, I think our providers, they, they just keep patients on their own. It's just easy, easier and mm -hmm. no reason to cycle on and off and get on your calendar. Well, the bottom line is that when you do that for your patients, they, they actually are doing very well, right? So the, the proof yeah, very, is- Very, very, yeah. very well. 90% 90, 90 just stay on. That's mm -hmm. it. That was a good yeah. One. Yeah. Um, so there's another thing about, um, I think I've seen some doctors being really concerned about, uh, people with heart disease and yeah. giving them testosterone. Um, yeah. and then, so what, what are your thoughts? Because so, you know, if somebody has a congestive heart failure or, or just, you know, cardiomyopathy, um, yeah. are you afraid to give them testosterone? So for, it, it would be contraindicated for somebody with, atrial fibrillation mm. if that were left atrium yeah if you had the atrial fib afib and you're, you're running the risk of blood clotting pooling in that part of the heart left ventricle going up um with an irregular heartbeat um because if you're on test and we do this for the patient but it's also to to protect i mean just straight up <laughs> to protect my my physicians from a, a, a lawsuit we have to think about that too so um, but you know, with, with AFib and certain cardiac disorders, like I talked about before, if you're running testosterone, hematocrit hemoglobin can go up, making the blood more viscous. Mm -hmm. So that blood pooling clotting would increase a little bit. So it would be contraindicated for somebody with unstable angina, really bad cardiomyopathy, really severe, you know, coronary artery disease. Um, on the other side of the coin, thousands of testosterone receptors in the heart. We see greater heart output, greater left ventricle ejection fraction, um, 
we see great things, you know, with preventative for, for heart, men and women. Uh, there's so many articles out with reducing um, risk of cardiovascular events. Um, but if you're, if you're far gone with heart disease, probably not the best patient. I just encourage doctors to use discretion with that. Um, we, we do. Um, but yeah, right. The correlation between testosterone level and mm -hmm. coronary artery disease is, has been very strong. Yeah. And more and that, healthy risks. Yeah. And, and that got skewed with patients having heart attack because they were taking way too much testosterone. Their hematocrit got to 80, mm. which is like double. And they threw a blood clot. Um, it's never happened on our watch. Abraham Morgenthaler says there's never been a case that he's aware of that this is happening to. But what we tell our physicians is we've never seen it, but you're not going to be our first. So <laughs> we're, we're going to watch hematocrit hemoglobin. And if it goes up, we're going to have you donate a pint of blood once a year. But they, again, these are mitigated with the, the the superior sort of advanced protocols. Like, I just don't see it go up when you do when you do the right amount, low dose, more frequently throughout the week. Mm -hmm. um, but it's something yeah. that we we, we do sur use surveillance on. I see. And what about pellets? Because I I know I have some uh, <laughs> friends who swear by by it and love it. Yeah, yeah. women love pellets. They, they love, they do love the testosterone pellets. It's a big business for a lot of these doctors. Um, you can make a lot of money doing it for the physician. Here's why we don't do it. Um, mm -hmm. Every single patient that my providers have seen come in who've been on patient, testosterone's through the roof. Mm -hmm. Women feel amazing. They're climbing the walls with their libido. They feel strong. Um, but all that excess testosterone has to go somewhere thinking about risk factors, okay? It's converting to DHT. Women will get thinning hair. They'll, they'll, they'll get, you know, others, other side effects with it. So just remember all that excess testosterone in the body gets converted into other things. And, you know, you can, you can have some virilization. I always say, you know, our biggest concern with testosterone or one of the, one of the things we try to do is I want to keep your femininity intact. I don't want you to go from a tenor to a bare tone in eight <laughs> And I want to, I want to keep you from virilization. I don't want, I mean, your, your voice can drop down and you can get little, you know, black hairs where you don't want to uh, <laughs> get a little bit, you know, more, more caring with, with your, <laughs> you know, with, with uh, just your temperament being a little bit short. So pellets are hard to manage because once those pellets are in, they're in. If, if a week later it's too high, what do you do? It's a little incision. They put the pellet in. It's it's a microsurgery. They're there. So mm -hmm. I, I don't like them. I cre creams are a little bit more diurnally sound and more naturopathic and easily right. managed. You can adjust it at any time. Yeah. Um, breast tenderness, go down a clip tomorrow. In 24 hours, the testosterone you did today is going to be out of your system. I could change mm -hmm. their, we, could, we can change their protocol in a day. Um, and for men, testosterone pellets, they have to have a lot more pellets to get to a man's optimization level, 12, 13 pellets. Um, when they're doing yoga or they're rolling around, you're going to fill 13 pellets in your rear end. And it can be, a, <laughs> it can be uncomfortable for a lot of men. Um, and same thing, testosterone goes through the roof. How do you control that? You, you, you mm -hmm. go back in and get him, get another surgery and take them out or it's, I know it's mostly outpatient. Yeah. I know, had, they, 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 I remember seeing some patients who are, you know, their testosterone level 1400 and they're, yeah. you know, they feel like they're flying. They they're love flying. It. Of course, actually, <laughs> this is actually the same person. I mean, that they got prostate issues. So I, I'm go. wondering if that is related, like too high of a testosterone. Yeah. And I think doctors are a little more inclined to give more. Because the patients are like, oh, I feel amazing. But again, DHT, estrogen, PSA is going to go up. Hematocrit is going to go up. Women are not going to be women for very long. Um, you might feel good, but all that excess testosterone is going to go somewhere. And it's usually in the form of a side effect. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So for men who have too much testosterone, what do you see? Um or rage hematocrit <laughs> hemoglobin going up well i like to say this is what we say you know the, the roid rage yeah is, is really more of a myth it, it's it's from testosterone here's here's the thing with that if testosterone goes really really high it converts to estrogen 
If estrogen goes up, what happens? Same thing it does with a woman with a woman during menstruation, little PMS, -y, mm. you know. And I think with men, emotionally, that can turn into anger. I know I know men that have come into come into our doctor's office and gone, I'm watching these Hallmark commercials of puppy dogs and I'm just sobbing. And it's like, oh, yep, yeah, your estrogen's through the roof. Um, so again, it's just control of the testosterone to make sure you're not converting to a bunch of, of, of estrogen. Um, and then oh, but that can also cause the gy gynecomastia. So if estrogen goes sky high, it, you can de get development of breast tissue, just like a woman. So you just, mm -hmm. you watch it. And if, if a guy's symptomatic of high elevated estrogen, come down on their testosterone dose a little bit, or you can run a. I hate doing it. We hate doing it, but a five alpha reductase inhibitor called anastrozole. Um, mm. But those can be little nasty drugs. But if we have a really obese patient where they're going to convert a lot of that testosterone over to estrogen, the aromatized enzyme lives in adipose tissue. So heavier men, if they even smell testosterone, they're just going to convert it to estrogen. So mm. smaller dosages more frequently with them. Sometimes in rare instances, we have to use a anti-estrogen pill, but Generally, you can control it by using low dose, more frequently testosterone. Um, and then, yeah, higher, higher estrogens, again, bad. It, your PSA will go up. Um, but the roid rage things, temperament, not really going to happen. I, I always like to say, look, sometimes if you take too much testosterone, um, if you're an asshole before you take testosterone, you're going to be a bigger <laughs> asshole <laughs> on testosterone. <laughs> you know, it's, if, if you're not doing this right. So listen mm -hmm. to our doctors take the prescribed dose, more is not better. Uh, and, and you're going to be, you're going to be good to go. Mm -hmm. What about women who may be really sensitive to testosterone? Cause you know, some of them may break out, right. With yep. acne. How mm -hmm. do you deal with that? Again, start low, go slow with women. I, I know some providers who've scared patients away, starting them on a relatively low protocol uh, mm -hmm. and 10 milligrams per milliliter, a little, tube and they start them on one click, start even lower than that. You know, mm -hmm. if, if a woman has zero testosterone in her body and you started, you know, on a dose that was, you know, you'd start people on, but they don't have any. And then you just give them a big bolus of testosterone. They could have little acne flare ups, things like that. So just start low, go slow with, with testosterone. You run blood work in eight to 10 weeks once you start somebody. And then you, you can kind of go, okay, yeah, we're not where we want to be. More importantly, how do you feel? I don't really feel much of anything. Okay, let's take a half step up. A couple of weeks on a couple of weeks later, they're like, "Oh yeah, this feels great. Hot flash is gone. Night sweat's gone. I'm crushing my workouts. I'm recovering like crazy. I, I used to walk into a room. For, you go, where are my car keys? Now I'm, you know, I'm you mean with testosterone. The testosterone can help oh, yeah. with the hot flashes. Well, um, well, sorry, that's, that would be all hormones, mostly okay. progesterone, and estrogen, with okay. progesterone, night sweats, estrogen, definitely with, mm -hmm. um, like in a couple days, generally women are going to see, they should see re results within 30 days. Um, we usually see it in about a week. Like, yeah. oh, so you use a combination. Um, how yeah. important it is for females to boost their testosterone levels? I mean, it's, it's not just take one hormone and you're better. It's a balance of all three. Mm -hmm. um, it's, a, it's a delicate dance and ratio of all three, um, which this is where if you're slicing and dicing the labs, it gets complicated. So don't do that. Just after time of working with patients, you just kind of know talking to them where they need to be, but it's testosterone balance of testosterone, estrogen, and progesterone. But testosterone is, is, is paramount for robust women, bone density, brain thousands of testosterone receptors on the brain as well as the heart as i said but critical thinking verbal memory i like to say you know estrogens for you know just like bone density things like that progesterones can be for the brain and the feel-good hormone Tes testosterone is for your motivation and it gets you up if you're a procrastinator it'll get you motivated to do things you'll start doing the things you used to love to do your workouts are great um you know, you're, you get a nice little sort of dopamine push, um, after, after like a great workout, it kind of carries on throughout the day. Um, yeah. And you put on lean body mass, which it's so beneficial to osteoporosis mm -hmm. and sexual health, like testosterone and sexual health go hand in hand. So does estrogen progesterone, but for libido, even thinking interest in sex, 
Like it's so important for women to do testosterone for their relationships with, with mm -hmm. their husband or boyfriend or whatever. And this is why we like to treat couples at the same time. If one couple's, if mm -hmm. one person's doing really good and the other one's not, you're going to have to like, mm -hmm. I'm like, Hey, y'all come in together. Trust me on this. Uh, our doctors have been doing this too long and mm, healthy relationships. yeah. Yeah. Do people have to be in California to see you guys? Um, no, we require, you know, a face-to-face -face visit once a year, but we treat patients all over. Um, mm -hmm. if you come see us, we do a physical exam. Our doctors put our hands on you. Um, we have custom compounding pharmacies that have the permission through regulatory agencies to, um, ship to all 50 states. So I'd, I'd say probably 95% of our patients are local. Um, and then we, we do have a few that have homes in different places as well as Santa Barbara. Um, but yeah, yeah, it's, it's as long as they come in and we do a physical exam. Okay. Amazing. So how do people find you and, uh, you. you know, uh, receive the Royal treatments? Yeah. So again, our, our clinic is called eternity health partners. It's AMI Santa Barbara.com. Um, and yeah, we're in Santa Barbara. We do everything functional, integrative medicine, bioidentical hormones, peptides, a lot of gut GI microbiome remodeling heavy metals, mold, regenerative medicine. I'm a proud vendor of Joy's for Chiro Biologics. I think it's a <laughs> far superior product. Joy and I are like calling each other. Ooh, man, I saw this patient. You're not gonna believe what's happening with this. You know, <laughs> my She's like, ooh, send me a study. Let's do a study. So yeah. Joy, Joy and I nerd out and have a lot of fun, but we do a lot the of- That's part of medicine is when you see people recover from yeah. really tough conditions. Yeah, that's that gives that gives us a high. I know that. <laughs> exactly so we're we're on the phone probably once a week nerding out and selling <laughs> celebrating so uh do a lot of yeah, joint prp and regen medicine for you know and then and then we do a lot of longevity medicine we run a biological age testing to see you know a chronological age and a biological age let's see how how old you are cellularly and then we use senolenics to you know create apoptosis of bad zombie cells and um just optimization on how to do that. And I, I feel like a lot of people also want to know what's, what's the best diagnostic tools out there. So mm -hmm. we, we use things like the clearly gallery cancer test, which looks at 50 different types of cancers from a tube of blood, early, early DNA genetic signals will be given off with certain presence of cancers. We run that, we run a clearly calcium score test way better than your calcium score. You're going to get at your radiology clinic, which just looks at hard, hard plaque. Um, clearly is going to run a test that uses AI and looks at hard and soft plaque in the heart. So a lot, a lot better. And then, yeah, just really so good. This is, this is imaging you're work. talking about. Im image, imaging. These are things that we, we do at the clinic, but yeah, that's about you it. You have a machine that can measure? We, we don't, but we refer out to, you could go to clearly.com and, and they have stations all over that I see. will do this. Cal this new type of calcium score. So yeah, patients want to know what's the, the latest and greatest with diagnostic tools for, you know, morbidity. So we, we, yeah. we, we have to always stay on the cutting edge of this stuff. So, uh, but yeah. Yeah. That's beautiful. Yeah. I'm, I'm so proud uh, of your accomplishments and how many people you're helping. So I, uh, I hope more people are, you know, are recognizing just the amazing work that you're doing and, uh, and cut and get some help from you. Um, sure. So, so again, I want to thank you for being here. I think it's a super informative session and you've given so many pearls to, you know, to the audience and um, answered um, lots of, um, you know, sometimes, you know, nitty gritty questions, but I think they are all important. The, all these are things that people are wondering about and they don't have an expert to go to, to really get the uh -huh. answer. Right. Sometimes yeah. it's, it's so confusing with all the information that's out there. Oh, there's there's so much. And I, I think if you, you know, if you don't have access to us or can't come see us, go to a4m.com or ifm.org. And there's a list of providers who are functional, integrative, or find a naturopathic doctor, find an osteopathy DO doctor. They come out of school for the most part knowing this stuff and are, are going to look at the whole system. They're going to going to look at sleep, stress, movement, the gut. Are you able to detox? They're going to look at the whole system as one instead of, oh, you're sad. Here's some Prozac and Xanax. <laughs> That's how we were trained. 
So, <laughs> which is why I'm not doing that anymore. Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. So yeah, we are all reformed. I'm a reformed MD, and uh, I'm catching up to you guys. <laughs> yeah. So yep, the medicine's moving forward, and um, that's why we go to A4AM because new things are coming out all the time, and um, there are people who are looking for the escape velocity, right, for reaching that pretty soon, where. Yeah, yeah, the rate of uh, anti-aging can catch up with the rate of aging, so we can stay, you know, stay put forever. Yeah. <laughs> that's <laughs> one of the, it's yeah. the fastest growing specialty, they said. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah it. Doctors are kind of fed up and dissatisfied. That's yeah, right. and it's a lot of fun to stay at the, uh, you know, the head of the spear. So, yeah. yeah, again, congratulations to your great work. So, um, okay, everybody, we're going to end here and thank you for listening. Thank you, Joy.